With inflation hitting the lowest level in over three years, rate cut predictions are forecasted to go lower and at a faster rate than we've heard essentially since they started hiking them. While this may be welcoming news for most mortgage holders, it definitely means the Canadian economy is in big trouble. Will the Bank of Canada cut fast enough to keep the country out of a global financial crisis level event? And ultimately, how does this all affect the Vancouver real estate market? Well, we are going to expand on all of that for you today, plus give a market update as the majority of the August numbers are in, and we're going to share just how far prices are falling this month. Let's get into it right now. Off the top, we definitely want to talk a little bit about inflation. And, and yes, that print came out last week, but you know, I was away and we, we want to expand a little bit on it because it is important. Because of course, the inflation level that came in, it beat expectations, right? Expectations were at 2.7% and the print came in at 2.5%. That is, in fact, the lowest reading we've seen in 40 months, dating all the way back to March of 2021. But even more important was the major slowdown in core inflation, right? That's what the BOC really pays attention to. And that hit 2.4 last month, down from 2.6% the month prior. Understandably, mortgage interest costs remains the largest contributing factor to our inflation rate today. In fact, mortgage interest costs contributed 1.2% to that total 2.5% inflation print. It's almost half of the total amount of inflation that we're experiencing right now. And ultimately, keep in mind, the Bank of Canada can essentially directly control that amount of interest rate uh, payments and, and, of course, their con uh, contribution amount with the overnight rate. So understandably, if cutting rates will directly lower inflation, the Bank of Canada will likely cut rates. And of course, this will also help stimulate all the troubling businesses and uh, people with debts that exist in our country. So the markets have now taken this inflation print and, and repriced in the rate cut odds. Right now, we can expect a rate cut at every Bank of Canada meeting for the rest of this year. So there's one in September, there's one in October, and there's one in December. That will end the year if they do a simple 0.25 basis uh, cut or 25 bips cut each meeting. We'll end the year at 3.75 overnight rate. And what's more, markets are currently expecting an additional 100 basis points next year in 2025. That brings the overnight rate to 2.75 by June. Okay, that's a snapshot of where we are today. We all know new data can come in and change that dramatically to the upside, downside, or status quo. But either way, as of today, that's what my markets are pricing in. 2.75% overnight rate by June. Okay, that's only 10 months away. But clearly, the economy is in deep trouble and the Bank of Canada needs to stimulate it to curb as much of the pain that we are experiencing. And that's forecasted to come yet again there or even what's more in the future here. And of course, that's via the unemployment rate increasing, via debt insolvencies spiking, and of course, our lack of GDP growth. But here at the Vancouver Life, we are a real estate channel. So let's discuss how these rate cuts that are forecasted could affect Vancouver housing. First off, the five-year bond has dropped to about a 17-month low and is currently sitting below that all-important 3% threshold. And should that sustain, as it looks to, expect about another half percent drop in fixed rate mortgages. Insurable deals are trending towards rates in the high threes. I mean, when's the last time we said that? And uninsured could very well see rates in the fours in the coming months. While these numbers don't really make Vancouver homes affordable, they do make those monthly payments slightly more digestible. And with prices falling in August for the third month in a row now, a rate cut happening next week at the September 4th Bank of Canada meeting, and the fall market just a, just a week away with us entering that with currently a five-year high in inventory, well, we may see some people decide that that timing looks right for them to both sell and or buy or both, of course. Remember, most people transact real estate when the future looks bright, right? It's, it's people buy and they transact on, on optimism. And right now, the housing landscape looks brighter than it has in, in, in a couple of years, at least. I'm not saying it's great, just better. Lastly, those looking at mortgage renewals within the next 24 months are, they're feeling or having a bit of a sigh of relief, if you will, as the renewal payments look to be much, mo much lower, excuse me, over the next two years than it would have been had they had to renew back when the overnight rate was 
Now, a quick comment about the renewal cliff, as this is still quite a hot topic for a lot of people. I've been saying for over a year that it's going to be a, a nothing burger, right? It's not going to happen. It's not going to shoot up uh, all these foreclosures, for example, or clearly flood the market with listings. And while everyone is, is essentially focused on people who are renewing mortgages that they took out four, four and a half years ago, here's an element about the mortgage market that I don't think anyone's talking about. Since June of 2023, over a year ago, there's been approximately 1 million mortgages that have either been newly obtained and or renewed. Okay. Today, today, the interest rate is lower than at any time since June of 2023. That means those plus minus million dollar mortgages could renew today at a lower payment. And this will accentuate next week when we see the rate cut on September the 4th. And then next month at the October 23rd announcement, which currently looks like they're going to cut as well. So as each month goes on and each cut happens, there's an increasingly larger proportion of mortgage holders that are benefiting from these cuts. And would ultimately, if they renewed, they would renew for, well, less, less monthly payments. Today, the total amount of people who could renew at a lower payment, it's maybe 15 to 20%. It, it, it's not huge but it's growing daily. And I just wanted to put that out there because everyone's focused on the people that, have, that are going to renew and pay for more. But guess what? There's an increasing cohort of people who could renew and now pay less. That's very interesting info. And, and honestly speaking, it, it is in line with the, the, the discussion we recently had with Mikhail, Bank of Montreal. Uh, in fact, one of the other elements I think I would add to that is that many buyers or, or many um, mortgage holders who are renewing are getting smart or getting smarter about how they're renewing. They're not just taking the renewal rate that their bank is giving them. They understand now that they can go and shop it at a different mortgage institution. And instead of renewing for you know 20 years, if you had a 25-year mortgage, you can reset your mortgage to 25 years. Granted, you're going to pay you know more interest and your mortgage is going to be longer. But if you're looking for payment relief, that is another way that we're seeing a lot of... Um, debt restructuring that's been taking place over the last year as well. So, you know, there's a lot of different levers and a lot of, maybe I wouldn't say a lot of different options, but there are other options for, for people who are renewing that will again, take away from this, uh, you know, renewal cliff that Dan has been talking about. Uh, what might be more troublesome than that though, uh, speaking to the long term here are our building permits and the future supply of homes. We've been talking for some time now how builders, uh, or sorry, how the landscape for builders is pretty unfavorable. And that remains very true today. The data is now really also starting to show that. And StatsCan just released that the total value of residential building permits dropped 11.5% in June alone. Nine out of 13 provinces are tracking decreases, and single family building permits they remain at 40-year lows. Multifamily permits too, they illustrate this even further, and they're down almost 20%, 19.8%. Ontario was down 26%, probably not too surprising, but BC was down a whopping 31%. These are dramatic numbers that if they sustain, will create significant shortages in the future. Uh, I mean, look, look to Toronto's new home sales as an indicator of what to expect from the construction industry and the future of building permits. New condo sales lead condo starts by 18 months, and new condo sales hit an all-time low in July. So low, in fact, it was below the financial or the global financial crisis and 70% below the 10-year average. Condo starts are about to fall off the map as well. The other side, on the other side of this coin, we also have completions though that are hitting all time highs. It's a bit of a lagging indicator, right? But up 16% year over year over the past three months, over the last quarter. So this largely contributes to the current rise in inventory that we've been seeing and why prices have been trending downwards along with rental rates. And completions are about to outpace new starts, meaning the amount of homes under construction will lower quite dramatically after that. It appears right now, anyhow, that the construction peak has happened. And now we're tracking the cycle down until building permits catch up again. 
yeah, just put yourself in a developer's shoes, if you will. And you're looking at the landscape and you're in Toronto and you're seeing that pre-sales are essentially at an all-time low. I mean, you're not going to go to market. You're not even going to consider a project. I mean, ideally, you know, you're cash rich and you're land banking and, and hoping for brighter skies, if you will. But right now, I mean, the brakes are on 100%. You don't bring product to market when nobody wants your product. You know, it'd be like a, being a sunglass manufacturer and the forecast is for three years of, of rain, right? You're, you're not making any sunglasses. You're waiting for, for sunnier days. Or you're making hats. There you go. Yeah, you, you, you shift and now you're in umbrella mode. But that's right. Regardless, you can just imagine, right? It's it's a very tough position to be. I mean, if that's your livelihood, you've built this company and maybe it's a, a generational family company and you've had it for four decades and all of a sudden the, the marketplace says, no, thanks. We don't mm -hmm. want your product. It's it's very tough. And um, we're going to concede, we're going to, excuse me, continue to see the construction industry really get hammered uh, probably for a few quarters here. So we're going to keep an eye on that. And we're also keeping an eye, obviously, on the mortgage market, because after a string of uh, upward trending months, meaning more and more mortgages were, were being created here, mortgage originations actually saw a very steep decline in June, down 15, 1.5%. Um, no exact reason for this, you know, all sorts of contributing factors, of course, summer, blah, blah, blah. But obviously, one month doesn't make a trend. So we're going to report on this next month as well as we do each month. But what trend we do have access to is the monthly growth trend, which saw 0.2% growth last month. That is actually very much in line with where monthly, month over month growth has been for, for two years. Uh, and it's actually below the growth in aggregate household income. Okay, so people are having more income, then they're taking out mortgages, and that'll, that'll keep the OSFI company or people over working at OSFI uh, quite happy, right? They, they don't like seeing people over leveraged compared to their household income. So the mortgages that are being taken out, what's, what are the popular ones, right? If the people who are buying today, what are they taking? Well, the most popular is still three or four year fixed term mortgages. And that's followed by even shorter term. One and two year fixed mortgages are the second most popular new mortgage or renewed mortgage today. But let's talk variable because I, as I mentioned on a previous podcast, if I were to buy or renew today, I'd go variable. And variable just saw its first uptick in new mortgages, basically dating back to late 2023. So about a 10 or 11 month first uptick. And as mentioned, I expect we're going to see this type of mortgage become more favorable over the next 18 months as the BOC sort of forward guidance indicates, well, maybe a 2.75% overnight rate by June of next year. Interestingly, there's two banks that are standing out with a lot of mortgage growth right now, averaging over 8% growth year over year, TD and BMO. Maybe some good deals over there, maybe some great incentives. So if you are considering a renewal, go talk to somebody at TD or BMO right now and see why they are so favored. 8% is well above the long-term averages and, and basically just seems to be that uh, those are the two lenders of the moment. So again, if you are facing a renewal or a new mortgage, explore those banks and obviously others, but those two may have something uh, enticing for you today. Yeah, let's move over to consumer sentiment to uh, get a temperature check here. Uh, consumer confidence index uh, is sitting, <clears throat> excuse me, is sitting in the 60s. Uh, and that's really a level we've only really seen before a recession. And while it's off its lows from 2023, it's still very low. The metric, as an example, pre-COVID was 120. Uh, and so for a baseline, you know, we're kind of looking at about 100, which was established in 2014. And part of the reasoning here is insolvencies. Consumer filings were up 4.2% year over year and up 12% for the quarter. Not only that, the average filing size is increasing as well. And what's more concerning are business insolvencies. They jumped 24% year over year and in June, uh, sorry, in June and 42% year over year for the entire quarter. Furthermore, consumer spending is dropping like a stone. After two summers of quote unquote revenge spending from COVID, the retail sales lowered again in July, taking the metric down in six of the last seven months in 2024. Understandably, it's hard to feel confident financially when all of this is happening around us. It's a very important metric. And like I said, it really does lead to consumer spending and of course, real estate purchases and sales. And part of what's affecting all of this as well is understandably immigration. 
the, the growth rate of immigration has become a very hot topic over the past few months as the 1.2 odd million people per year growth we've seen over the last couple of years has proven to be, well, too many when it comes to the ability for this country to properly house and employ that rate of population increase. See, on, on top of this, um, on top of record rental rate growth, housing prices and pressures on our medical system, what looks like excessive population growth has also resulted in many jobs that could have been filled by Canadians going to temporary foreign workers. And the government's reaction is now to temper that growth rate, ultimately by restricting the number of low-wage temporary foreign workers and reducing its target for permanent residency, essentially bringing back its pre-pandemic rules. And when we kind of look at what's caused this, it's almost gone full circle, right? Like, let's do a quick recap here. Back in 2020, the, the government shut down the economy and businesses during COVID. And uh, to compensate for that, they just handed out free money to everybody who wasn't working. And even, of course, a bunch of people who were took advantage of that too. And people, well, they get very comfortable receiving free money for not working. And then what happened, of course, is when businesses could reopen, well, Interestingly, the taps didn't turn off and that free money, those free checks kept coming. And the younger generations were like, well, I get a check and I don't have to go to work. Well, what are they ultimately going to do for the most part? Right. Why, why, why would they, you know, free money for not working for many could technically be pretty attractive. So what happened? Well, you have all these, you have all these, these job vacancies, right? So the businesses called on the governments and said, look, let's open up the temporary foreign worker floodgates to fill what at the time was a record 1 million vacancies nationwide and, and the government, they did. But then all of a sudden, a few months later, that free money stopped and people had to go back to work. But many of those jobs were now filled with temporary foreign workers, right? It did its job ultimately. But Canadians kind of got angry about that, right? Um, a lot of young people especially couldn't get jobs because they were filled by temporary foreign workers. And, and these are again, what they quote or what they call, I believe, low skill foreign workers, right? There's the full gamut, but a lot of lower skilled TFWs were, were coming to the country and, and taking in those, let's say, um, food services jobs is kind of the, the hot topic or, or the most relatable, I think. The foreign worker, temporary foreign worker numbers um, are being pulled back to ultimately open up those jobs again for Canadians. And it kind of to me, like it, it's, it's a bit bizarre, but ever since COVID, it just kind of feels like our government is acting in extremes right? The economy should not ever see a 475 basis point move in our, our Bank of Canada overnight interest rate in, in a matter of, of basically months. The country shouldn't see the need to quadruple the rate of immigration year over year. The country and economy should ultimately be boring, really, right? The, the administration, our administration needs to kind of just let things calm down and stop what feels like overreacting, right? Let small, incremental, well-researched, well-educated policy shifts take place. Not these massive pendulum swings that sends the country essentially into a tailspin, right? Thanks to immense collateral damage that seems to ultimately never be considered, right? Like, okay, cool. Wow, we need jobs. We need people. Quadruple, 1.2 million into the country. Oh, wait, there's no homes. Rents go skyrocketing. Oh, uh, hospitals are backed up. Like, you get it, right? We talk about this a lot. But ultimately, Stop making these radical shifts in policy and just make incremental, smart, educated choices is my advice for our lovely government. You know, it's funny when you, when you say all of that, you kind of, you know, chronologically, you, you, you can see there, there wasn't a whole lot of, of thought going into this. I mean, when you really think about it, a lot of the temporary foreign workers that fill, you know, skilled labor or, or unskilled labor positions you know, talk about like college pro painters or, you know, landscaping companies, things that like I used to do when I went to university in the summertime, jobs I used to just pick up. If you start paying the general population free money, and then you bring in all of the population to fill those jobs, whatever happened to talking about cuts? Remember when we used to make budget cuts, like not spending that money and telling people to go back to work? Imagine what would have happened if that was actually the case. We wouldn't have this immigration problem because the people were already here. They just didn't want to go to work because they didn't have to because the government was paying them. And then that led to this massive inflation problem that we ended up having. So not very well thought out when really 
uh, maybe I think firmer, harder decisions could have been made that would have led to a much better outcome. But I don't know if our federal government has the capacity to make really tough decisions because they just seem like yes men. They don't say no. They don't make hard decisions. They don't make cuts on things that would really financially create stability. But anyways, I digress. Let's get back into some building costs here because this is another element that has, I think a lot of people were expecting to come down, but recently uh, we're seeing that that may not be the case. So with the cost of building being so high and affordable housing, one of the main focuses of the government, you would think we'd be reporting on stories about how they're actually trying to bring the cost down, but unfortunately, the opposite appears to be true. And this goes again back to this sort of thinking and this foresight. On Monday this week, the government of Canada announced it will impose import tariffs on steel imported from China, the world's largest producer of steel. And the tariff is 25% and comes into effect on October 15th. And guess who gets to pay for the tariff? The home buyers course. These tariffs are pushed down to the home buyer and may result in higher home prices and ultimately we're importing inflation. This is yet another glaring example of the government telling us they want to do something uh, to make homes more affordable, but turning around and acting in a completely different manner. As the saying goes, I'd rather just see the actions speak louder than words. At this point, I don't really trust what the government has to tell us. I would rather they just do it and show us, but that's just me. Yeah, it's, it's again, another action step towards higher housing costs. And it's, it's almost weekly, it feels like, that there's a new, new fee, new tariff, new cost. And anything, everything's just kind of going up and up and up, and it just makes the margin so much more difficult for builders, which means they pull back, and then nobody can afford it because there's so few, and we just go back into that cycle again. Mm -hmm. Well. We're going to end this today on a bit of a mini market update um, because we're recording this, what, the second last day of the sales month of August. So obviously the, the majority of the data is in here and we'd love sharing it with you first, right? You're going to hear the media talk about it next week, but we want to get it to you today, especially when there are dramatic changes. And yes, there are. So sales in the month of August, they're going to end up around 1,850. And I hope that sounds low to you because it certainly is. It's low. It's the third lowest sales month for August on record dating, or sorry, only behind 2012 and 2008, the global financial crisis, which we have been <laughs> referencing ad nauseum here for almost two years, right? This market emulates the GFC. Uh, new listings were basically on par with last year, just up slightly. But inventory, the fun inventory story is, is still a story. And it, interestingly, it has not crossed 15,000. We've hit this sort of like 14,900 ceiling for, for three straight months now. And August, obviously, once the uh, expiries and removals happen, we're going to wash out, I don't know, around 14,000 here. Now, prices, prices are where things get even more interesting. Median price is dropping 25,000 bucks this month and is going to end up at about 945,000. That is the third monthly decline in a row. And it's basically brought us back to almost January prices, right? We've wiped out all the gains, if you will, of 2024, and we're now back to almost January prices. And let's reference the peak because that's always interesting. Medi uh, median prices are now 5.5% below that 2022 sort of March, April peak. And if you remember, we reported just last month on average prices dropping $60,000, a pretty dramatic drop. Well, it dropped another 30 grand in August. So average prices are down $90,000 in just two months. Let's reference the peak. Average prices are now about 7% under that peak. So with those two rather dramatic price drops and with the downward price trend, we're going to see HPI come off as well. They'll do their, their equation, their math on that. It's probably going to come down about a full percentage almost in August. And that'll be also the third monthly decline for HPI. HPI is going to uh, end up about 6% down from the 2022 peak. Again, these aren't, these aren't crazy numbers, right? 6% from the peak after two years of 5% overnight rate. It's shockingly resilient, especially when we look at Toronto. But here's the big unknown. 
what is going to happen in the fall market this year? Because we are really set up for something interesting. I've got a, a couple thoughts here, but Ryan, let's start with your predictions first. Maybe if it's only even September. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Uh, well, a couple of things. Um, you know, we're working through a, kind of a new set of expectations for home buyers and home sellers. Uh, you know, a landscape they they're you know not in least at least with recent memory they're not entirely used to, especially if you're a new home buyer or a new home seller. And so, you know, I know we, we've we just kind of capped at about 14,000 listings for the month of August, but historically, September and October show surges of inventory. So it's possible, you know, that we'll continue to see listings creep up to that 15,000, potentially even surpass that 15,000. Now, on the flip side, you've got, you know, interest rate cuts that are likely going to be coming at every single meeting going into the fall. So you're going to have, um, you know, the stimulus side of this taking taking effect as well. Though I do think there's elasticity in the marketplace. So I think there's probably six to nine months of standing inventory that would need to get really chewed into before we start to see prices really kind of make any meaningful gains or or even or temper just where they're at. So I think, you know, in the short run, um, it's going to continue to be a little bit bumpy. Uh, we'll see how home sellers react. The last time interest rate cuts took place, you know, a surge of listings came when a uh, it was expected that the surge of buying would come. I don't think affordability has really got there yet. So I think there will be more listings. I think we could see generally activity pick up, but the numbers will be bigger. So the percentage changes will likely be smaller. At least that's kind of where I see the short run. Uh, the long run at this point is still kind of anyone's guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're really spot on for most of this. We did see, like you mentioned, I'm going to expand on this. The last two rate cuts actually brought more sellers to market than buyers. And I really think September is going to uh, illustrate that further. Um, I know for ourselves, we've probably taken what six listings this week alone, Yeah, you know, for all people that want to list in, in early September, because people, yes, they all know the cuts coming in, in, uh, October, the, sorry, September the 4th. And people think, well, you know, people's buying power is up about 7% or so from, um, worst case scenario back when the overnight rate was 5%. So, Hey, everyone's ready to buy. Right. Well, I think there's more sellers thinking that there's buyers and there are buyers thinking that they're sellers. If that makes mm -hmm. sense, mm -hmm. right? So we will likely see a pretty dramatic inventory spike in September. Maybe we'll cross 17,000. You know, it's, it's going to be a, a seven, an eight, a nine, maybe a 10 year high in inventory. Mm -hmm. And yes, there will be an increase in sales activity. But again, we're coming off of literally the third slowest August in history. So, you know, we got a low baseline to work with. There will be renewed interest. Sure, the good homes always sell, but uh, I think sellers are going to outweigh buyers and we're going to continue to see prices actually dip mm -hmm. in September. Um, and then we're going to see, you know, another inflation print. And if things keep trending down and the optimism keeps coming, sure, maybe some more movement in October. But uh, I think overall, a slow grinding market compared to the 10 year averages uh, with a slight downward pressure on prices for September and October. Well, we'll talk about that in 30 days. Yeah. I think the last piece, maybe the last caveat is, you know, we really got to see what the States does as well. Uh, if the U S continues to drop uh, or, or begins to drop, uh, and the markets change and that, you know, creates optimism too. Uh, you know, there could be, you could pull some of that buying from, from maybe 2025 into 24, but I, I think, Largely, Dan, um, echoing the same sentiment that you're putting out there. Perfect. Well, time will tell. Um, great to be back. Great to see everyone again. Look forward to next week's episode, which will be, of course, the actual August numbers. And we'll expand on everything else that has happened in the week that is important to Vancouver housing. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. And we will see you next week. Bye.